On our Indigenous Women's Leadership Panel, we have Katsu Cook, Yewalokwas, meaning she's pulling the baby out of the water, out of the earth, or a dark, wet place. Gatsi is a highly respected Mohawk midwife who works to promote processes of care, both clinical and sociocultural, that support Native American women and girls in developing control of their reproductive power and voices. She is a Native American rights activist and a women's health advocate. Gatsi is a nationally and internationally recognized community leader working at the intersections of environmental justice and reproductive justice. Ripa Evett Carlton was born in Cumberland Sound, Nunavut, but lived on the land until her family was relocated to the community of Pangnertung when she was five years old. In 1989, she moved to Ontario. She has worked as a family support worker for several years where she worked closely with the CAS in Ottawa, the AODS Committee of Ottawa, and extensively with the Canadian Centre for Substance Abuse while facilitating the groundwork to translate the first Inuit-specific trauma and addictions treatment curriculum from Inuktitut to English. Ripa co-founded the Mamis Servic Healing Center, the first Inuit-specific trauma and addictions treatment center in Southern Canada. In 2019, she presented at the hearings on missing and murdered Indigenous women. Manulani Aluli Meyer is the fifth daughter of Emma Aluli and Harry Meyer, who grew up on the sands of Mokapu and Kailua Beach on the island of Oahu and along the rainy shoreline of Hilo Paliki. The Aluli Ohana is a large diverse group of scholar activists dedicated to Hawaiian education, restorative justice, land reclamation, Ohana, health practices, culture revitalization, arts, education, prison reform, transformational economics, food sovereignty, and Hawaiian music. Manu works in the field of indigenous epistemology and its role in worldwide awakening. Professor Aluli Meyer obtained her Doctorate of Philosophy of Education from Harvard in 1998. Welcome. Kahonda Kwas, Diane Longboat, is a member of the Turtle Clan, Mohawk Nation, and Six Nations Grand River Territory, Canada, and a citizen of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. She's a ceremonial leader, traditional teacher, and healer. Diane is founder of Soul of the Mother, a healing lodge on the shores of the Grand River at Six Nations Grand River Territory with extensive relationships with First Nations in Canada, the United States, and globally. This session is going to be moderated by Nahani Faye Schudemacher. Nahani is of Mohawk, French, and Dutch heritage. She is an artist at heart. She's in the Indigenous Studies PhD program and is inter interested in the intersection of gender, Indigenous knowledge, and climate. This session is being supported by the Indigenous Women's Symposium. We have some absolutely wonderful people here. Let's all give our panelists a warm show of gratitude for their wisdom, knowledge, and time. Seigo, Seigo, Aloha, Anin. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Indigenous Women's Leadership Panel. Uh, my name is Nahani Shunamaker, and I will be making sure today's panel runs smoothly with the assistance of others who are behind the scenes. I am so honored to introduce our luminary presenters who are with us today. Uh, Gudgie Cook, Riva Evick Carlton, Manulani Aluli Meyer, and Diane Longboat. Each knowledge keeper will have approximately 20 minutes to speak, uh, to share with us, and after they have spoken, after all four have spoken, there will be roughly 10 minutes for questions. Next, I'm going to pass it over to Riva Evick Carlton. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you for having me here. I'm honored to have been asked to participate uh, in this gathering, in this workshop. I originally came from Nunavut. I live in Ottawa for the past, I would say 30 plus years. I come from a very small beginning. I was born on the land where my mom and dad were still solely living off the land. So my first uh, five years were spent um, on our beautiful territory, uh, which was around the Cumberland Sound area where I come from. 
So we lived in Kammaks, which I would say salt houses um, in the winter months. And because Inuit had always traveled to where there's good hunt, hunting area for different animals from spring till fall, we would be traveling. And so the winter months would be at the Kamma, at the regional camp. So I was born in, in the Kamma uh, with the um, as the main source of light, which um, was a women's uh, traditional oil lamp in the middle of winter. So we have, we have dark seasons in, in the winter, in the winter months. So, um, and we had no stores, no nurses, no doctors. So the local midwife would be called to help somebody who was uh, in labor. So the local midwife came and one of my uncles who passed away not too long ago was a young teenager. And before he passed away, he told me the men were out hunting when uh, my mom um, went into labor and he was in the camp uh, with the women. He told me that he was very excited and a little scared because he's never had to experience somebody in labor before. So um, I, um, I lived in that wonderful camp for, like I said, the first five years of my life, but my mom and dad always took, uh, took us out of school to go camping from May till maybe September. So we would have these really long um, periods of where we were on the land. And little did I know, uh, because I was just too young to remember everything that occurred with the forced relocation uh, that I would go back in my, uh, late, uh, I would say in my, like I said, I would always go back with mom and dad, but when I became a mother, they used to take me out camping with my children. So um, I would dig the soils of this old campsite for anything I could find, beads, pieces of glass, whatever I could find, and I started collecting them. One day, an elder came by who was also camping there, and she did have a camp of her own uh, before they were forcefully moved. She came and sat with me. I had my baby in my back, in my amalti. She came and sat with me as I'm digging the soil, and I wasn't really thinking, I said, how was it when you were moved? The question just came into my mind and I asked the question. And from then on, I realized the tremendous loss that my people have had since, since um, the the children were picked up for residential school from these little camps, the forced relocation, because what she did was she started to cry. And I just let her cry. I didn't know what to say. I didn't expect her reaction. She just cried for a while. And then she started to tell her story, which impacted me uh, even deeper because now I'm putting the pieces together or I have started putting the pieces together of what has happened to us. Because when nobody's really telling the stories, we're confused and lost within ourselves why things are the way they are. So what she told me to me was profound. She said, one day a stranger came into that little camp which included my mom and dad and me as a child and many other families who were scattered around the, the Cumberland Sound and other part of where I come from. She said, we 
did not bring anything. The only people, the only thing that came with us were the people, the children, the husbands, the grandmothers, uh, the adults. And she uh, just grieved that at that moment. And um, everything that they owned, which were not many because my people didn't have a lot of resources, but they survived the very harsh environment um, of Canada. It's, it's a cold environment and it can be harsh. There's no woods, like we don't have wood up there. So in that sense, it's harsh, especially in the winter months. Um, she said, they left everything behind. They were told not to bring anything. So she did say somebody went back when they were able to, to gather what they had left behind and everything was demolished. The, the hammocks, everything inside was demolished so they couldn't bring much of anything from their previous life. So it really kind of paved within me to really start looking into my history. And I've had these moments in my life where an elder or somebody would just start sharing their stories. And it just started putting the pieces together. And for me, because I had to go to school when my, when my family was forcefully moved, I started going to school before I would have learned everything by observing what my mom or other women were doing in the camp. I would have learned to do all of the women's um, um, skills, special skills that they needed to survive. I miss all of that. So, um, and one of the things I started doing was I started working with an elder. She's still alive today. I, I call her my mentor because she's the one who really hear, hurt me when I didn't even have the words to say what I was going through because I would just be crying um, also because I went into a relationship that wasn't healthy. So I had to heal from that plus what my parents had gone through the, because of the intergenerational impacts that had on us people. So that lady, the elder, really helped me to make me who I am today in many ways. She's also never gone to school, but she was recognized as, um, she received a doctorate degree because of the work she's done throughout her life. And um, she just started documenting how many years ago, maybe, in, maybe in the 70s, she started documenting in her language, in Inuktitut, in my language, the things that she was doing with her people by letting them talk and cry and, and learn, begin to heal from these past hurts in their lives. So I went through that with her and I'm very um, grateful that I did that with her because I wouldn't be who I am today if, if I didn't sought her out when my need was great. So, so from, from all of these experiences, I did develop PTSD. I, didn't, I did not know that. I had moved to Ottawa with my family in 1989. And I've always, I was always very interested in this helping field, helping my people, even though I was suffering also. Uh, within myself. Um, so I started working for Tungasubing at Inuit here in Ottawa. It's an agency that serves Inuit people um, that are living in, in Ottawa and 
um, outside Ottawa. So I became a community support worker. Then from there, I went to uh, work for the Mamisopic Healing Center, which started in the early 2000s. And our funding came from the Aboriginal Healing Foundation. So I was going to school to get my, you know, my trauma and addiction training. And I, being in school, I self-diagnosed myself with the symptoms that I had. And I, I even went deeper into healing, into getting healed from, from the hurts of my, from my past. So it's my passion to see my people recover because we can recover. We all can recover. And uh, so it's shaped me to be who I am today. The things that I went through that were very, very hard. And for the Inuit people, um, we've always, uh, in, in the time mom and dad and my ancestors, there's always been a system there that wasn't written but it was lived from day to day and one of the teachings that we have from them is to keep moving forward and to be quick to talk to somebody especially if you're not fe feeling great within yourself so these teachings I have within me and when I went through a very difficult time um, after we were relocated in that uh, relationship I was in, I had my first five years were nothing but safety, security, the love from the people who lived with us in this camp. So I had that to fall back on and um, even if I was very young, because I, I, I knew there was a good life. There was a good life that my people lived from day to day because things changed for us drastically for, for uh, Inuit people. I'm sure it's the same with First Nations people. So, um, so I... Um, and Inuit always had these principles, the eight Inuit uh, which, which promotes good life, you know, helping people, serving people, looking out for one another, uh, moving forward. And um, so even if we were not taught these things at school, they were within us and my people lived live throughout ages with these principles within them and to um one of the things that i really value about uh, my 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 people is to be able to help and to serve and to share um so in these small camps that's what people did that's what my people did if one family was struggling more than the other, the, the help was always there from another, another family member. Um, and um, living in the South for the past 30 years, I'm grateful that I've had this opportunity to, to grow as a person and to understand and to go to school. Because for Inuit, we did not go to school like until until we were forcefully moved, I did not go to school. And, um, and I didn't go to high school. So, but we do have life experiences and these speak highly of who we are as people today. And um, so my people live through um, the dog team slaughtered, they, their, their dogs were slaughtered after they were relocated. And there's many stories to share about these, these very hard times and people recover, people are resilient. And we are moving forward with whatever hardship we're gonna face, we have the tools within ourselves. 
and we have each other. This elder that I was talking to you about uh, is very in tune with her spirituality. So she's, she's helped me with my spirituality too. One of the visions she had was people, different races of people coming together and holding hands and being there for one another to help, to support, to love, and to, to, because we need relationships. We need people also to um, advocate for us, especially when we, we haven't been living in the South and we don't have all the education. We need, we need people that can help us move things forward um, from uh, by their skills also, because some of us might not have that ability or skill, but we have the experiences. And thank you so much for listening to me, hearing me today. Here we go, Aripa. Thank you so much. My apologies about the sign. I was told it was <laughs> backwards. <laughs> it's okay. I, I see a continuation of what Goji was saying before about the continuity and that effort to continue passing forward knowledge and, you know, working with an elder. I think many of us, especially younger people, are looking for those mentors in our own communities as well. So very relatable. Thank you. I'm going to pass it over to Manulani. Aloha. The stage is yours. <laughs> Kevelina Ake Aloha Uluai Kevelina Ake Aloha <laughs> Auntie Ripa, that was so beautiful. Thank you for that story. <laughs> Thank you for that more olelo. Auntie Ripa, there's just, just the thought of all that nurturing from your birth to five and then to be taken and to, to survive that, to say we all can recover. You know what I mean? That gives me strength. That gives me confidence. That gives me faith in, in, the, in the turning of the seasons, mm -hmm. in the inevitability that we are already healing. Because Auntie, Auntie Katsi, your message was also singular. How about global singularity? Hello, that was so fantastic. I have not heard singularity as a word in 30 years. It's a rich idea of, you know, in, our interconnectedness that we are building sisterhood right now. We're building sisterhood. And Auntie, Auntie Katsu, Katsu, when you said leadership is an emergent property, like, wow, totally. It so is. And um, we are emerging together. I, I really believe that uh, even Diane, you and me, every time, it was just like we just felt the same thing differently. So good to see you, Diane. So good to see you. Blessings. Really. And that image behind you says it all. Says it all. And the color blue, that dark, dark, beautiful blue is the expansion of our hearts. Aloha mai kakoa paui kuumahoa. Hello, everyone. What an honor to be, to be in this group of, of women leaders. Really, at Tiripa, I still, anyways, thank you. Thank you for, for responding and using your life as, a, as understanding your PTSD and going into it and being of service. 
same thing with you, Auntie Katsi in the 70s. I think I was a young teenager, just wondering, you know, who Donna Summer was. You know what I mean? Our people, our people were completely um, transformed with colonization. And I don't even use the word anymore because we're so, so, so strengthened by the, um, the inevitability of this time. I love that. It's a sacred time of renewal. Thank you for that, Auntie Katsi. It is a sacred time of renewal. And this is yet another form. I appreciate that. May I use that? Because it, it does feel like a renewal. It really is. And um, uh, I want to tell you that in Hawaii, we're calling this the hulihia, the great turning. Our people have prophesied about this. That which is above will descend, that which is below will rise. Our communities will gather and we will be of service to save the world. <laughs> I, I believe that. Mm -hmm. We've been teaching our kids that for 30 years. You, you know, and my word for this year is embodiment. And embodiment is that um, you, you take your principles that you learn, Auntie Ripa, early, early on, and you express them. That effulgent coherence is the embodiment of our kupuna knowledge. I'm being mentored. I'm the luckiest duck on the planet by a woman named Auntie Lynette Paglinawan. And she is, she is a beloved kupuna of our people. And she's been mentored by our um, pristine and just open-hearted scholar practitioner named Kavena Pukui. And um, she, they brought on the field of Ho'oponopono onto the planet. And uh, of course it's been changed into a, a 14 line. That's not Ho'oponopono, <laughs> but it is, I value any form that gets us into healing, but just, just don't name it a Hawaiian thing. But um, what our Ho'oponopono is, is the activation of goodness to return to goodness, Ho'oponopono the activation of truth to return to truth. And so I have um, been, been mentored by this kupuna for the last, you know, 20 years, but I've been her kokua for the last five. And um, what she has taught me is it's time now. It's time now to bring forth the, the things that have been, you know, just like Aunt Katsi, when you're saying there's, there's 10 uh, mentorings happening, she's, when, 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 I, when the pandemic happened, I said to her, Auntie, Auntie, we can do it on Zoom. Then we can have it to hundreds of people. <laughs> and she goes, okay, Manu. So we're on Zoom now. And she is putting this beautiful, her class right now is called Kaumaha. Kaumaha is to be, is to be um, um, sorrow, depressed. But Kaumaha is her course right now. And it means to, to, um, um, to be um, in sorrow, but to also know, to, to have the tools to develop your resilience. So resilience is the, the uh, birthright of our people. And um, she's developing and she's taught us some very, very um, beautiful tools like Auntie Ripa, you have, and with, we all have, but to actually bring them forward into a discipline, into a into principled practice is our renewal of this time. So one of the main principles, I, I'm gonna give you three of them that she's, she's, well, we've been practicing it my whole life in Ho'oponopono. Ho'oponopono is a ritualized way of, of forgiving within a family. It's very ritualized and it's a, it's a way of communicating. But she's, um, she's brought it out. She's, she's, I've, always, I've always wanted to, but when you get the kupuna, okay, it's your, it's, you can do this. So um, it's, my friend calls this time, the au pula pula, the time where everyone, um, the age of the guru is over. The, the, everybody must become their own guru, their own teacher. That's our word for teachers, kumu. Kumu is, is um, tree. And um, the, the olelo no eao is ha hai no kaua i kaulu la ao. Um, plant a forest and the rains will come. Meaning allow people to, to absolutely be the fullness of who they are. And then the rains will, will moisten again the soil of our own rejuvenation. So aunties helped us bring out ho'opono, 
um, uh, Kukulukumuhana and um, uh, Mihi. So these are these are kind of sacred practices. So I, I offer them now because she's she's created them as Noah, as um, they are available to all of us. Ho'opono is the ability to speak um, pono, to speak truthfully. And, you know, when, when I learned that years ago, I thought, oh, I'm speaking truthfully. And it, I think it was about 40, <laughs> but I said, no, I'm not. And um, learning that uh, I was really taught to lie uh, as a woman changed my life. You know what I mean? How are you? Well, I'm fine. You know, like, no, no, you're not. Or how much is this shirt? Oh, you know, I'd say some number and it's totally not that. So I lied all the time. And I just, you know, you just, you're young. So um, Auntie taught me ho'opono to activate your, your, your sound of goodness and be truthful. And there is a truthfulness to everything. And you know, when, I, when I'm not truthful, you know what I say? I, I say stuff like, wow, I just lied. I can't believe I just did that. Everyone laughs and then I laugh. And so I catch myself now, um, you know, I just do. And, and it's been very helpful to say, wow, I just lied. And, and then to say, I love myself, I love myself and to get back on the, the track. And, and Auntie has taught me that um, in Ho'opono, it means to always speak true. Also, um, kukulukumuhana is a very important idea for our people. When we kukulukumuhana, we, we energetically combine our forces for goodness. So we combine our energy. And I know we all have these practices, but now our kumpuna are bringing them forward, our elders. And so we can, um, when auntie goes, okay, we kukulukumuhana now, a hundred of us, you know, be quiet and a hundred of us you know, gather energy. It could be on Zoom. It could be in a, in a room. And we just, we send our aloha to that person who's ill. We send our aloha to that person who's called maha, who's in, in deep sorrow. And then, and then we were quiet and then we actually energetically, you know, feel it. And then that person calls us the next day and we're like, wow, what happened, you guys? Did you do something? I'm like, yeah, we did. We did. Because we all know we do that there's more to life than the physical plane. Our kupuna knew this. We, we have words, ike moi, our, um, our, our dreams, the knowledge in our dreams, it's so valuable. So now the dreams are coming. We ulaleo, the night voices, they're coming. The uh, akaku and the kipupu, our skin sensations, they're here. Um, so our kupuna are helping us um, gather them again and not feel discouraged by um, the, the truncatedness that, um, that we all experienced with the change of, of our lives. Um, and then the third, the third thing is mihi. Um, I think the mihi is, um, Nahani, you are doing the mihi, mihi very beautifully. It's when people um, give thanks for the ideas that are shared so that meaning making is, is a co-collaborative um, emergent possibility. So mutual emergence happens when we honor and recognize the beauty, depth, and significance and purpose of our lives. And when we share that with another, the party's on. So I appreciate um, your quality of facilitation, my darling. It's very, very, um, um, it's very, very beautiful to bear witness. And um, we, we pass the baton to very competent um, women leaders. And that, just, that warms my heart. It really does. So this is, this is the nature of our times, is to bear witness, to recognize the beauty that we all hold. Because all I do nowadays, they, they ask me, I just talk about my friends. I'm going to talk about Kukui, a woman who developed the Hawaiian food sovereignty movement in Waianae. We need food sovereignty. And Tikatsi, you're so right. Our food security is vital. And um, she started 25 years ago in a, in a place that no one thought could do anything. And there it is, the change. And that is where change happens when you least expect it. But Kukui Mauna Kea, look at Ma'o Farms, M-A-O, Ma'o Farms in Y and I. See if you can find that. Kukui is, is my mentor and I just love and adore her because of her passion in growing leadership amongst our Hawaiian people. 
Also, Luana Busby Nath developed a kapu aloha energy of the mauna, of mauna kea. Kapu aloha means reverence for loving. So she has been on the aloha aina movement, the, um, the movement to um, understand the centrality of indigenous knowledge. I mean, it just boils down to two ideas, love land, serve people. Oh, wait, or is it serve land, love people? <laughs> I could have gotten backwards. Well, it's inside, outside, backwards, upside. You, you know, love land, that's it. That's it for us. And, you know, people go, oh, you don't like science. You don't like telescopes. You're like, no, we love science. We love telescopes, but this is the old science. This is the oldest science. We got to love land and serve people. And so that's Aloha Aina. And that is my friend, Luana Busby Neff. And she has a store called the Hawaiian Force. Okay, get that Hawaiian Force up there. It's the best t-shirts ever. Uh, and then another friend, oh my gosh, Pulama Collier, six foot four, Olelo Hawaii, she's our language teacher. She, you know, she comes up and says, Manu, you know, we got this pandemic happening. Why don't you start um, Ea Hawaii? Okay, Ea Hawaii. Ea Hawaii, it does not mean sovereignty. Ea means freedom. So she's in our PhD program. Ta-da, we just made it up. <laughs> And you know what? She needed someone to talk to every week. So every week, and you know what? She's developed Ike Pa Pa Kolo. Let me tell you about it really quickly. As a language scholar, teacher, and a musician and an extraordinary, early talented woman, she developed the concept of Ike Pa Pa Lua, Ike Pa Pa Kolo, got it. And, and that means three. There are three ways to develop language understanding. The Ho'opukaku, which is the literal or the authentic, she calls it the kauna, which is the multiple or the, um, the metaphoric. And the third is the noahuna or the esoteric or, um, or personal. And so what it, what it allows us to do is to, to make forages into our own language and not be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You know, people say, do you speak uh, your language? I do not, I do not because I'm stuck on aloha and pono and ike, those three words. You know what I mean? Once I get what aloha really means, I maybe might, you know, learn our language. But there's so much to um, the depth of our people's language. We don't have to laud it over people. We simply need to take some words and ike kai ho honu, go deep, 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 and then express it, embody it with our actions. Just like you do, Diane. Just like you do. I love that about playing with you. And finally, um, I'd like to thank and recognize my friend, um, uh, Ku Kahakalao. She developed the Ea Eco Ecoversity Movement. And the Ecoversity Movement is changing the world. I think 40 countries are on this now and it's, we're, we're just taking back our education. Um, she developed the Hawaiian Charter School Movement 25 years ago. And it's time. We are all saying the same thing differently. You've got to have same and different in the same language, in the same sentence, because that creates the hologram. That creates the wholeness that is our people's brilliance. And um, what an honor to be here. I just feel like I'm a young one jumping around like a little runny bat, bunny rabbit, because I'm so excited to, to, to actually experience this, um, this sacred time of renewal. It is a global singularity, as you can see. It's beautiful. It is. We are, the huli here has happened. And how we respond, how we um, radically collaborate, and how we connect into what loving really means. Because we believe, really, that aloha is the primal source of our collective emergence. So mahalo e ki o kua, na kini o kua, na auma kua, na kupuna o ki o vahi puna hele. Mahalo kakua pao e kuumahoa. Thank you for this time and this opportunity to share and to bear witness um, to the energetic force of our Na'aukoa, our warriors of light. Thank you. Mahalo, Miao, and thank you so much, Manu. You bring us from tears to laughter, back to tears. And I think there's such vulnerability in that, especially in spaces in academia where we're not told to be allowed to express those things. Um, 
and thank you for acknowledging um, my role here today. I, I would be amiss not to acknowledge my mom who's hiding amongst the many participants here today. <laughs> she has taught me well, very, very well. Um, I also just wanted to mention that the quote that you said, plant a forest and the rains will come. I remember in encountering this in your work and crying about it because it's really about embracing uh, the gifts that we carry. So thank you so much. And last but not least, I'm going to hand it over to Diane. So I pass over the mic to you. I am so grateful to have this sacred opportunity to sit with you, Gaji and Ripa and Manu and Hani, just to feel that loving energy that comes from you and the joy that you have for life and the absolute strength that you're you're walking in the world with and it it strengthens me to hear you and absolutely the words that you've spoken today are medicine for the next generation and i'm so glad we have nahani here and and actually we're recording everything so it's a double bonus i want to really begin by lifting up my ancestors my life was generations in the making from all of their sacrifices all of their achievements Everything that they went through and the struggles of life, everything has emerged in who I am today. And I, I, I lift up my mother, you know, as, as my first teacher, my auntie, who was uh, like second mother to me, you know, and, and many, many women in my life who have influenced me, taught me, and um, listened to me and listened to my stories. I'm so grateful to be here today and to think about this, like just thinking about this topic. When, um, when I was choosing a background to share with you, I, I chose Christy Belcourt's work and it's called Offerings to Save the World because I believe that each of you are the creator's gift to us for this turning time, this time of an emergence of a new era of spirit. And when I think about, you know, I look for patterns. I look for patterns in life. I, I look for patterns in uh, human nature. I look for patterns in the natural world. And I believe that the pattern of life was set for us in the spirit world, in the sky world, before we were even born here. And you know, I often go to the story called The Creation Story by John Mohawk. And I, I read that book and I reread it because every time I read it, there's so much more in it that nourishes me. And he talks about a little boy and a little girl born with very special gifts in the sky world. And they were taken, and especially the girl focused on for loving, for nurturing, for caring, for protection. She was taught and she was prepared for life. She became sky woman. She married, she was pregnant with new life, and she was the first human-like being who fell from the stars to come to this world that was then covered with water. And so Sky Woman became Grandmother Moon. And so for all of us who are women, we understand that the Grandmother Moon is a leader of all women. She has, a, she has power, and that power is co-creative power to ensure that there is a continuance of life on the earth. And that, that grandmother moon also works with waters to ensure the movement of waters on the earth. So mother earth is always constantly refreshed and renewed. If you've ever had that opportunity to see glaciers melting, there are faces of our ancestors in those glaciers. And when those glaciers melt in this era of environmental shift, the prayers of those ancestors melt into the waters of the earth. The water has memory. And so as much as we are fearing this time of, of environmental shift, you know, I really want to up, uplift all of our people to say we will survive this shift. We will understand as Ripa said, and Gaji said, and Manu said, first law of the earth. Mother Earth is a chief, and, and we are the servants to her. When I think about 
you know, the Sky Woman becoming Grandmother Moon and she came here to this place of water. She, there's a beautiful story that goes along with the creation of the earth, but her daughter became Mother Earth, nurturing us, sustaining all life. And when I see Mother Earth, I see her standing at the very center, the core, and there's a beautiful fire that's burning there. And she's standing with her long dress and her long hair, and she's holding a beautiful basket of, of medicines that she's putting into her fire, praying for every single blade of grass every day, every bird, every human being, everything that is on the earth that is of creation. How powerful is that, that she is in love with every element of creation as much as she is in love with us. So I think about her and the daily prayers that she offers for us. And I think about then the twins that came about after the daughter who became Mother Earth, the twins that were, were born and the twins that helped to, to build the rest of creation. And I look to those twins and I say, thank you for creating a balance here because some of them created foods, other ones created poisons, poison plants, but they created balance in the universe and we need that. We need this place to be a mirror image of the sky world. Just like Manu said, this place, and we were given so many, so many tools, so many ceremonies, so much of a rich heritage to understand that we have to recreate that sky world here on, on the earth. And it is women who are going to be leadership in that regard. We understand that, you know, our, our Indigenous women's traditions and power come from our teachings and from our ceremonies. The Thanksgiving address for Haudenosaunee people, the four sacred ceremonies, the great law of peace, the Kaitheo, which is our, our prophecies. So grateful for that cycle of ceremony all throughout the year that there's so much power in the language and in the prayers and in the offerings and the songs and the dances. And can you imagine, you know, as we, we need tree medicine now during this time of the pandemic and there are eight trees that are serving us. Can you imagine how they feel when we dance for them and sing for them and make offerings for them and we make medicine for them and put it on the land? they become enlivened with energy and they have even more power to do the work that they do in the world. And they come to stand with us when we need help. And when we take their medicine, you know, it, it helps us so much more because we've expressed as human beings our love and our respect for them. That outcome of, of that indigenous wisdom that each of these wisdom keepers have talked about makes us rich as peoples, indigenous peoples globally throughout the world. It builds us with a good mind, with reason, with respect, with compassion and empathy and kindness and generosity, like all those things that, that we say are our highest values and that we wanna live by, we wanna learn about and Manu described them so well. So when I think about that pattern for women's leadership, I say this to you, all who, all who are listening, the women, the men, the young people, the children, the two-spirit people, that we are sacred human beings. Women are sacred human beings. And I remember sitting with one of our faith keepers, Albert, Alfred Key, when he was teaching us on a Thursday night, and he was, he was teaching us about ceremonies and the depth and the meaning of our ceremonies. And he's Cayuga, so he would he would teach us with uh, Kyuga language as well. And he, he said that woman, woman is so powerful and so sacred, it is as if she is walking off the ground. She has not just a co-creative capacity um, to bring new life into the world to, for the continuance of life, of creation, but she has spiritual gifts. She has a spiritual mandate and we, we need to be able to embrace that in the world. That's where healing comes from. Healing has to happen as Manu described because of that monster we call colonization. We need healing to realize our greatness because we are, women are royalty. We are the evolved descendants of Sky Woman. 
and Mother Earth and the Grandmother Moon. Like we are, we are their descendants. And so how we see ourselves in the world is how the world is going to see us. And it's time for us to stand up and say to the world, here's who we are, here's how you respect us, and here's the honor that, that we command with the indigenous wisdom traditions that we represent. The world is waiting for us. We need spiritual training, just like Manu talked about, spiritual training to use our gifts to bring harmony into the world. And it doesn't matter what, what gifts you have. Every single gift is important. Every single human being and every woman that is born in this time period, and we have some, some new babies in our family, girls. And so we're, we celebrate that because these girls are going to be so powerful in the world that they are going to have seven times seven times seven power that we ever thought we might hold as that little drop of wisdom that the creator loaned us. So we are leaders in all fields. Every single woman is a leader in all fields. You know, when we think about, you know, who are the, who are the patterns that we want to emulate in our life? I think of Jibon Sase. And it was, it was she who confronted the most powerful, evil, sorcerer, bad medicine man in the entire Confederacy territory. She sang her bird song to him and, and lured him out of that darkness. And when she put the gentleness of her hand on his shoulder, he began to remember the love and the nurturing and the compassion of his mother. And she began to, in, in metaphorical terms to comb the snakes from his hair, straighten his mind, help him to remember that goodness that Manu talked about, the truthfulness. She helped him with the healing, the physical healing of his body. And it is said in our tradition that he accepted the great law of peace as a result of that. And that, that name, Taradaho, the one that she heals, continues in our, our Haudenosaunee Confederacy today. A chief sits with that name today, representing everything that that healing can represent from a woman, the strength of that healing from a woman. So I want to say something to you today, uh, grandmothers, wisdom keepers, that our survival depends on a change in human nature. Every single one of you is on that path. You're walking that path to bring change to human nature. Whatever, however we think about, whether it's education or, or midwifery as, as Gaji is doing, bringing those ceremonies back into the families, how beautiful is that? We are going to be and emerging now at the forefront of our leadership, not only in our communities, but nationally, and we are emerging globally. The role of women, and this is what the grandmothers say, the buffalo said to me, the role of women is to nurture the earth. It is women who stand to determine what is justice for creation. We are living at this emergence of a new era. There is going to be something evolved that I wanna share with you today that came from the sacred fire in our lodge. The message was this, you were born to change the world by birthing a new mind for humanity in whatever role you choose to play to restore harmony and balance for the first law of the earth. The, grand, the grandmother Buffalo also shared this with me. She said that in time, as we see colonization fall to the ground, capitalism implode within itself, that communities are going to be the ones that we need to focus on to build strong communities. That's why the work that you're doing in food sovereignty, in language, in culture, in healing, in new economics, in new ways of producing energy is so critically important because our survival depends on community. It doesn't depend on transnationals. It doesn't depend on, on the kind of capitalism that we have now. Our survival is going to depend on the strength of community. And the grandfathers, the grandmothers told us this, 
that there is going to be an evolution of a global women's council. They are grandmothers that are so deeply steeped in their own wisdom traditions, their own spiritual power, that they have justice built inside of them. They are going to be the ones that are going to be, for lack of a better word, ruling the world. They are going to be the ones that are the, the, the way that society is going to move into the future. The grandmothers, the great global grandmothers council. We're going to see that start to emerge amongst the work that you're laying now as a foundation. But it's Nahani and her generation that's going to do the heavy lifting. And it's her children and her grandchildren that are going to push this forward. This is going to happen, and I know it's already going to happen because the grandfathers and grandmothers never tell me anything that is not going to unfold. And so, you know, I trust the spirit more than any human being on the earth. I trust the spirit. The spirit is the one that guides. The spirits are the messengers of the creator. And that is not to say that men don't have a place in the world or, or anyone else. But it's, it is the heart and the soul of the woman that is going to be called forth in that great global leadership. We're going to witness that. So I want to leave it there. And I, I want to turn it back to Nahani and say, thank you for being our strong pillar today to guide us through this conversation and, and to carry your good heart into the future. I know that you didn't take on this work just because it was assigned to you. You took it on because it's your heart's work. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Gaji. Ganalunkwa. Thank you, Manu Ganalunkwa. Thank you, Ripa Ganalunkwa. I love you very much. I honor you. Remember you in all my prayers. Thank you. Niawe. Thank you so much, Niawe Goa. Uh, before pointing me out, I was going to say I very much hear your message of picking up our languages, picking up our ceremonies, and very much tying it back to what all four of you has, have mentioned today, that continuity and focusing back on what roots us to our lands, to our territories, and to the earth. So thank you so much, all four of you. I am so incredibly humbled to be able to be here today and to help facilitate this space, but you four are truly the, the superstars here. All these people have come to hear your words and I am just as grateful to hear them today. So thank you. We did have a couple questions that I would like to present to um, these four women and um, there, there seems to be a, a collective question come up about wanting to know how one can be involved with the, the different aspects that you've talked about. Uh, Spirit Align in particular, how can uh, young ones in the Haudenosaunee communities be involved? Um, also, Manu, how can people get involved? I know you say, just come to Hawaii, come, come and farm, but um, what are ways that we can um, collectively come together and help support these initiatives that are happening? I would, um, I would say um, for myself that um, my children are my legacy and uh, everything that I have, everything that I am, I, I pour into them as, as medicine for their life to move forward. And I have no doubt in their capacity to bring um, immense change into the world. When, when I think about others who need the same medicine. I say to you that our fire is burning at Soul of the Mother uh, on Six Nations. And so we're located right by the Grand River. That fire of peace was lit in 1994 and it has consistently burned for healing, for teaching, for guidance. And if you were to ask me, you know, what is your calling in life? My calling in life is to teach spiritual warriors of peace to stand in the world with all of their gifts and to bring change into the world without fear without fear and so you know i i really am so grateful for that land that we understand was ceremonial land for Haudenosaunee before we even moved there and it's documented in historical records. And so the land called me home in 1994, a, a vision from the buffalo, 
was the icing on the cake. There we go. And so, you know, it, it, for me, it's all about the land and falling in love with creation. And one of our clan mothers came to visit me and uh, shortly after I moved home and she said, to be truly happy in the world, you have to fall in love with all of creation. And those who do not will never defend it. So we're called into the world. There's no doubt about it. Thank you. Yeah. I had uh, an opportunity to go and visit my grandfather's um, uh, grave uh, on the land where my, in my, close to my community anyway, about a few years ago. Mm -hmm. I never heard about him being buried so close to where I grew up, but my son and I were up in my community doing some work with the local people and one of our cousins who was, who is older than me, really wanted to go and see the site of our grandfather's, um, um, where our grandfather was buried and we did that one morning before our work day started. And I will never forget that because I totally believe our creator was uh, very satisfied in, in what we did that morning because we fixed up his uh, grave because back then people just uh, buried people with, you know, rocks because we had no wood to put them in. We could see his bones and the man fixed up his grave. And uh, we, we all said something to our um, grandfather, thanking him for coming to that region from afar, like from far away, met up with my grandmother and here we are. And, so we said our prayers and um, it was in July that summer. So there were still some ice floating around, but we traveled by boat. We were all so very quiet uh, in the boat before we took off to the community. And I, um, I just, I don't know where this came from. But I started to smell this beautiful, beautiful scent. And I can honestly say it was the scent of Lily of the Valley. You know, that beautiful, powerful little plant, the white one that grows early summer. It was that scent. And I'm wondering, where's that coming from? I'm up here where this plant doesn't grow up there it only grows in the south and I'm like I'm just breathe, breathing it in I'm just letting this happen and I knew I was at the right time the right moment and our creator was very happy of what we just did so I didn't speak to anybody about it so we're on our way to the community and the, the men the people in the boat with me started to see something ahead of us. I was so deep in my thought, I wasn't paying attention. Um, I've never seen the bowhead whale all the times I've traveled the ocean because they almost became extinct because the whalers hunted them a lot long ago before my time, but there were three right in front of us. I'm like, oh, this is beyond, beyond whatever I expected out of this. So these things are happening. Um, I know that there's a comeback to the bullhead whale up where I come from. More and more people are seeing them. So I was so, so honored to have witnessed that and to have that scent of that beautiful flower. Uh, I do not quite understand what it means, but the more connected we are spiritually and every which way we're meant to be, 
the more the more we're going to have these wonderful experiences whoever we are because we all come from one creator thank you auntie and i just want to say that that is it that is more evidence to makahana kaike our olelo no eao our proverb that says by my actions teach my mind so those experiences of the aroma, we actually have words for that. They are ho ailona. Um, <clears throat> when when um, coincidence meets a portent meets intentionality. And that, um, that singularity uh, moment is about your capacity to be ready, open, willing. And then, and then the nature absolutely recognizes that and, and, and leans in to be of service. So it's kind of like surfing. Um, if you have, uh, I, uh, I'm a surfer, and uh, if you surf, you don't just think, you don't think, you don't think like, am I going to go left, right, up, down, right? No, you surf. So, Auntie, you went out and you took care of your kupuna bones. Makahana kaike. Don't think, everybody, too much thinking, you PhD students. Makahana kaike, makahana kaike. We didn't, our kupuna didn't say makaike kaike. We're not thinking, so we know how to think. We doing, we do, so we know how to think. By my actions, teach my mind. Thank you. Thank you, Manu. And thank you to you, uh, Ripa, for sharing that beautiful story. Um, got me choked up. <laughs> thank you for sharing such, such a, a personal and touching story. I have um, one last question that actually segues quite nicely from your last statement about that we all come from one creator. Um, someone in the chat, uh, Pritam, has asked, um, how can young non-Indigenous women be mentored to help them realize their spiritual mandate and thus to help cure the ego of colonizer society from within? Can select young girls and women be guided in this way somehow to sow seeds of original wisdom in all four directions? I believe we as human beings all have that capacity to tap into um, the, the spiritual realm because it's for everybody. But recognizing too that there's leaders in these, in these things that we go through and for me, I've, 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 my people have always been very spiritual, being very aware of the unseen uh, forces. Um, and so it's within, within us as first people that we're very much in tune, in tune with that. The more healed we are of the things that have happened to us, the more we, we just go into these areas so it's for all people but for people that want to learn more about these things like i did with my elder that's what i did i was mentored mentored by her and whatever she has on her some of it came to me and it also came from my ancestors uh, so I'll just leave it at that, uh, something to, for people to think about. And um, the three ladies can answer more, I'm sure, with this question. Yeah. Uh, Diane, Manu, do either one of you want to speak? We're planting coconuts, OK? Just like I think Katsi saying, all, all I'm interested in doing is planting coconuts. OK, newnow.org, because I used to say 25 years ago, if the coconuts get the alas, if the coconuts get, if Hawaii get coconuts again, we're gonna heal. Because now coconuts are seen as an ornamental liability and there's no relationship. So now all we're doing is giving away coconuts and helping people um, grow coconuts. Cause that's, we have a relationship again with um, food, land, culture, ideas, you know, rope, vinegar, sugar milk water i mean it is the most amazing it's called the tree of life in the pacific it's called the tree of life new not new now.org n-i-u-n-o-w.org 
So please uh, know that um, you can do something right now. Just look around and be of service to our mother and help your mother, help her in any way you can and start from there. Uh, it's not a heady thing, it's embodied thing. So, so clean up the, the river by your house, clean up your, your, your empty lot next door, clean something up and malama aina, aloha aina. And, um, and you know, our old word for land is called aina aloha in Hawaii. Aina aloha, aina is that which feeds our land. And we call our land aina aloha. And it means the land that has always loved us. But in the seventies, we had to turn it around. Actually when colonization happened, we had to turn it around say aloha aina so that we um, uh, were practicing the reciprocity or simultaneity needed to wake up. So we wake up by being of service to something, be of service to land and people and watch what happens. Thank you all four of you so much. We are so far over our time and I am being repeatedly messaged to wrap everything up, but all of you contribute such wonderful words of wisdom. Thank you. Thank you so much.